as Clive has said, we're looking at the carols um, throughout Advent, and this evening we're looking at Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Now, there is no specific Bible reading that I have for you this evening, so that's why my Bible's down in the pew, but I have verses cram-packed um, in the pages in front of me. I was talking to a lady at the five o'clock service, Margaret, who who plays the piano for us, and I was talking to her about Hark the Herald, and she reminded me, she said that she had a very old minister, um, I think it was from a congregational church, and he said to her that, that this carol, Hark the Herald, is the, the carol that has the most gospel packed into it. So while my Bible's in the pew, we are still before the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and this carol that was written many, many years ago. And these carols can have a strange effect on us. Nobody ever sat you down and made you write out the carol. Nobody ever taught you the carol. You didn't sit down with a hymn book before you and think, I must learn this. But what amazes me is how you start away in a manger. I never taught my daughter how to sing it. She only sings it once a year. And yet there she was as a wee tot, she knew the words. And over the years, we have sung these familiar carols and they have seeped into our consciousness and they can have a very emotional effect on us. They, they, they take us back to childhood. Yet they look forward to the hope that dwells within us. And, 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 it, and it's a huge impact on our hearts as we sing. And even as we were singing at the five o'clock this evening, um, I found my eyes getting wet for, for, not usually at this carol, but as we were singing, um, Oh Little Town of Bethlehem. And you know, whenever you try to sing and your voice is a bit wavery and your eyes are wet, and you can't get to the end of the line and you're glad you're not singing on your own. Um, that's what it was like to sing, Oh Little Town of Bethlehem this evening at five o'clock. But this evening, we're looking at Hark the Herald. When Clive said we're doing this, it was very much, uh, well, I took it anyway, as it was, uh, you can pick your favorite carol and you can talk on it. So my favorite carol is Hark the Herald. And I have been singing it for years, and it's um, anytime my dad is there that we're singing it together, he knows it's my favorite. And I'm expecting him, and he always looks at me, and I always look at him, and we give each other a little smile as, as we know we're starting to sing what is my favorite carol. Maybe it's, it's one of your favorite carols too. Because I've been going to church all my life and for as long as I can remember, probably in my mid-teens, we started to go to two church services on Christmas Eve. And the reason why that was, was because we couldn't decide out of which one of the, the two of these services that we liked the best. So we just decided we would go to both, and that was right up until the days when, when I came here. So on Christmas Eve, we would leave the house early, because you had to leave early to get a seat at the cathedral in Downpatrick. And this was carols by candlelight on a grand scale. It was a grand building. There were grand people there. There was always the bishop was there. There was a robed choir. There was other visiting ministers and priests from the, from the local community. The chairman of the council was there with his chain of office. And, and there was very much a sense of, you knew that families had, had come home, hadn't seen each other. There was, there was babies and children knocking about. There was ones who had just come home from, back from university. And it was such a lovely, warm gathering. And you saw people that you didn't see from year to year. And... I would always check, and we always did, thank goodness, it was the last carol, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, with the organ blasting and the, and the candles flickering. And uh, it, it was wonderful. And we would go home and we'd have something to eat, and then at quarter past 11 at night, um, usually exhausted, but we didn't want to miss this next service, because it was so good, um, off we went to our little local parish church, and this uh, was a little church uh, off a side road, off a side road. If you met another car on it, you'd have to reverse. 
um, a little hidden place way out of the way, no street lights, it was dark. And this was where we gathered with the people we knew, the people that we worshiped with Sunday by Sunday, and families that had, had gone back generations. And it was a beautiful little church and at the end of the service, the lights were cut. The only light in the whole building was the little light over the organist so she could actually see the notes to play. And whoever was leading the service would take their little candle, everybody had been given a candle on the way in, and they would go to the Advent wreath, they'd light their candle, and they would take it to the first row of the congregation, and every candles, candles would be lit. And then that row would turn round and light the next set of candles. And one year, as you did your candle like this, my dad spilt wax on my mom's good wool coat. And we, talk, we talked about it every year since when we went to church. He wasn't allowed to light his candle. But that sea of light as we were singing Hark the Herald, because everybody knew the words. So even in the dark, we could sing it. And as we were singing it, the sea of light from the, church, from the front of the church was working its way back as everybody was having their candle lit. And we would go out having sung Hark the Herald Angels Sing, out into the darkness, not a street light. And the thing was to try and keep your candle lit as long as possible. And we'd look up into that dark sky that all those thousands of years ago, that same sky that the angels had, had burst through to, to the shepherds to announce, announce the birth of Jesus. And it was in both places, I, in singing in the cathedral or in the little tiny country parish church, I always described it as we sung this carol, like it was as if my heart was running around my body doing somersaults. That was how I could describe the joy of the truth of this carol, you know, particularly as, you know, we belted, and you really felt the whole congregation was, was belting this out, born to raise the sons of earth, born to give them second birth. And in singing that, I knew, I knew, I have a second birth. I am going to live forever with Jesus. And in those two lines of that one carol, you have the whole gospel, born that man no more may die. Because we see, don't we know that familiar verse in John, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. I learned that in the King James Version. I can't hardly say it any other way. And then we look at, at, at 1 Thessalonians, where it says, For the Lord himself, with a cry of command, and with the voice of the archangel, and the call of the sound of God's trumpet, will descend from heaven, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive will be caught up in the clouds together with them to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be forever and ever. And then in 1 John, I love this verse. It says, beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this. When he is revealed, we will be like him. For we will see him as he is. And there are many verses and there may be other verses going off in your head. As I say that line out of the carol, born that we, may, that we will die no more, born to raise the sons of earth. The whole gospel in two lines, the whole of God's story in two lines in this, in this carol. And that's what I want us to do as we look at this carol, because as I looked at this carol, this is what jumped out at me. And that's what I want us to think about for a few moments is, is God distilled? God brought down this is glory brought down. Because whether it's in a grand cathedral or whether it's in a country parish church, in every verse of this carol, and actually there are five verses in this carol. Now, neither Mags didn't know that tonight at the five, and neither did Elise know that, and neither did I know that until two, uh, a week ago. So I really feel I have been quite uh, hard done by. I've been singing this carol all my life, and I've only ever been singing three verses of it. 
And then I discovered that there were two more verses to this, and we are going to sing it this evening um, in a few in a few minutes, um, because every verse in this carol starts way up there. Do we have the PowerPoint, guys? There's, there's two there's two slides. If we have it, the first one. So if you can make that out, it's the world, and then it says Bethlehem, and then it's a homely kitchen. And that's almost like the way these verses, that's the picture that I want you to have in your mind as we go through each of these verses, because it goes from the glorious, from the splendor, right down to the minuscule in each verse, from the magnificence down to the manger. And the glory of God is to be found in both those places. So we're going to look at this verse, verse by verse. So there's five verses. You will know the first three verses, uh, and then there's two that we don't know. And the the first verse of Hark the Herald Angels Sing, well, that just takes us right to Luke's gospel, to the grandeur of the heavenly host. And I say this every year, and I'm sure I've said it to to many of you here, so it will not come as a surprise. If I could have been anywhere that night, I would have wanted to have been on the hillside with the shepherds. And that's that bit of the story that I love where they, where they burst in it and it says, then an angel of the Lord stood before the shepherds. Imagine you're a shepherd. <laughs> you're just going about your business. You're maybe lying down to sleep for the night. And an angel of the Lord stands right before you. And the glory of the Lord shone around these poor shepherds and they were terrified. No wonder. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace among those whom he favors. Way up there, the heavenly hosts. And then when you come to the last bit of the first verse, it says, Christ is born in Bethlehem. Glory comes down to a place on planet earth, to a bunch of shepherds on a hillside outside Bethlehem. And had it not been here, had it not been Bethlehem, we, might, we would never have, Bethlehem wouldn't have you know, been on our radar at all, like many other Middle Eastern villages that we, have, we neither know nor we have any concern for. But everybody knows Bethlehem, because the angels came down to the shepherds and told them to go. And then the second verse in Hark the Herald starts with, you know, in the highest heaven, the everlasting Lord in eternity, the everlasting. Here we have eternity before us at the beginning of this verse, and then it comes right down to time. And it says, that uh, late in time, behold him come, offspring of a virgin's womb. Now that is not because Jesus was late. It tells us in scripture, it tells us in Galatians, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent his son. And Romans then takes us on a bit further and it says, while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Nothing surprises God, nothing pushes God off his time scale. At the right time, he came into this world. He clothes immortality, clothes himself with our mortality. Jesus is our Emmanuel, God with us. God from highest heaven came down into the minutes and hours and days and moments of our time. And then when we look at verse three, we have, we we see the why of why he came down. And at the very beginning, it talks about this magnificent prince of peace, you know, whose righteousness is more dazzling than the sun, than the planets, the prince of peace. And he comes down and in the, the version that, that Charles Wesley wrote and the, the version that I know and that I like, the line is, born to raise the sons of earth. Now that includes us all. He came down to the sons and the daughters of dust. 
And Hebrews says, for a little while, he was made lower than the angels. And it goes on to say why, why he did that, why he's mindful of us, because he cares for us. And that verse goes on to say that there's healing in his wings. He came to bring us healing. He came to bring us wholeness. He came to bring us life, to give us a second birth. I just love that. My heart really could burst when we sing that. To give us second birth into his eternity. That's what we have. No matter what life throws at us, no matter what we're facing, when he's in here, you have that second birth. You have been born again. And I know some people don't like that phrase, but that's what it is. You have been born again. Let's call a spade a spade. You've been born again into his eternity because he didn't just come down to have a look around. He didn't just come down and visit us. I think it was like Krista Berg sang. Some of you will remember a spaceman came traveling and they call it a Christmas song. He didn't just come down to visit us or to walk around and see how we were getting on. He came to die. And we think about that at Advent. I don't think we should think about it even in all the midst of the joyous celebration. You know, we do sing born a king. He was born a king. He wasn't born to be king. He was born a king, but he was born to die. God of highest heaven came down to be a sacrifice to die our death, to walk our way so we could walk his way, his way into eternity. And then we go to verse four and five, which will be new verses to you and to me to sing. Um, And it starts with the nations. So it goes right up there to the nations. And it describes Jesus being the desire of nations. Now, it might not look like it now, as they war and fight. But Haggai says that he will shake the earth and they will come. They will come to Jesus. Jesus will be the desire of nations. And then whenever you go through into the New Testament, the New Testament paints that picture of what it's going to be like when it says that it's a a multitude out of every nation and tribe and language will worship Jesus. And that is, when that is fulfilled and and completed, that is the completed, fulfilled, finished time when the serpent, because in this verse it talks about the serpent's head, and that takes you way back to Genesis 3. That's when the serpent's head will be crushed. And as we we sing this verse, it, it, it goes on to say how he humbly makes himself at home. This is how he does this. This is how this is completed, finito, finished, fulfilled when he returns. Because until he returns, he's working. He's constantly working and he's humbly making himself at home in us. I mean, just imagine Jesus is making himself at a home. You know, sometimes I think we, we say, you know, come into my heart. And it's like, you know, when you bring somebody into your house and you want to show them around. And I had my aunt on the Curacy house the other night and I said, do you want to see around it? Which Sydney was disgusted and says, don't show her our bedroom. You know, but you want to show people around. But the fact is, when Jesus comes into your heart, you don't show him around. He's at home. It's his natural habitat. And he does that because he comes and he sweeps clean the humiliation that we live, the the separation that we live from him by the power of his blood. And it goes on in in, in this verse by how he joins, it sings about joining thine own nature to our nature. That's how he does it. He joins his nature to ours. He overcomes our darkness that is within with his nature, like we sing about the light and that light can't that the darkness can't put out the light and the light exposes the darkness and it overcomes the darkness. And that's what happens when his spirit comes. It comes and moves in us. It comes to cleanse and to heal and to bring his his life. And it says in Ephesians 5 that everything that is illuminated with his light becomes light. So when his light enters in, the light of his truth, 
the warmth of his truth, it enters into our heart. Because this is where the last verse goes. The last verse starts with the grandeur of, of God and it talks about the image of God and how that is, and we cry out, stamp it on us. Stamp the image, your image on us within our heart because that's what, he comes down, he, he wins us back. He makes his home in our heart because the last line, and I just love this last line that I've never sung before until the five o'clock service. He forms himself in each believing heart. He doesn't come on a congregation en masse. He comes on an individual heart. And then it's those hearts that join together that make the family of God. And he comes on your heart. And if he hasn't come on your heart, he wants to come on your heart. And he will come in to every believing heart. You know, sometimes we think that that is quite a childish, and maybe you've grown up and, and you've heard it as, from you were no, no high about asking Jesus into your heart, and you've done it at every meeting just to make sure. I've heard so many people say that, you know, and that it's almost childlike and it's simple, and you might hear some, uh, some intelligent person say, but yes, but asking Jesus into your heart, that doesn't even say that in the Bible. It's not even there. Um, that's not how the Bible describes becoming a disciple of Jesus. But Perhaps that phrase is not there, not in so many words, but when you look at John 14, John 14 says, those who love me, and this is Jesus saying it in, in the gospel of John, those who love me will keep my word and my father will love them and we will come to them and make our home, make our home with them. And Revelation goes a little bit further to tell you actually what that looks like when Jesus comes in to make himself at home. It says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him. That's what we do at home, isn't it? We eat, we eat at home round our table. It says, I will eat with him and he with me. We will dine together in the heart. And don't we say the home is where the heart is? These are phrases that we use. Don't we say that the kitchen is the heart of the home? That's why I have, if you can see it, a nice, warm, inviting kitchen. And that should put a, perhaps a new slant on when you go to make your breakfast in the kitchen tomorrow morning that you will think, goodness, the kitchen, the home of the heart, my home where I want Jesus to dine with me, to come and eat with me. Because you see, it is in the heart that we're converted. We can know things in our mind, and sometimes we know them in our mind first, and they drop to our heart. Sometimes we can just know that we know in our heart, and then we go and discover maybe more about it with our mind. But we are converted in our heart. Yeah, and I mean, I know, yes, if there's any surgeons among us here and they might say, you know, well, it doesn't say that in my medical textbooks, you know, if I was to cut you open and, and to do open heart surgery in you and I was to look at your heart, I mean, all I would see is an organ off the body doing its duty, pumping the blood around your body like this big muscle with the hiccups, you know, and yet we come here tonight and we talk about the heart and, and Jesus coming in to our heart. But you see, God knows and the Bible tells us and, and we know, we understand that the heart is the seat of our affections. It's where our desires come from. It's where everything flows from. I don't say to somebody, I love you with my whole brain. I hold you in my head. I say, I love you with my whole heart. I love you from the bottom of my heart. I mean, in a scientific textbook, we know that things spark in our brain and, and, and that's where our emotions come from in a, in a scientifically. But we know as human beings, there's, there's a deeper level and it is in the heart. You know, I love that phrase about the, the disciples on the road to Emmaus. You know, when they turn to each other, haven't been with Jesus, and they say, didn't our hearts burn within us? And then when you go into the Old Testament and we see actually where God looks, 
God said to Samuel, I don't, I don't look at the outward appearance of a man. I look on the heart. And that's why we have to guard it. And yet Jeremiah warns us that the heart is deceitful above all else. Jesus tells us that it's out of the heart that those things flow. It's not what goes into a man that makes him unclean. It's what comes out. That's why we need him. That's why we need his cleansing. That's why we need his Holy Spirit within our hearts because our hearts can deceive us even with what's good. We can be deceived. That's why we have to be so careful because we can fall into all sorts of difficulty, even with the good things. You know, sometimes it's true, you can have too much of a good thing, you think it's good, but it actually can end up wounding you if it's out of proportion. So as we think about, uh, about the heart, I think it's, it's good actually, and it's really interesting and helps when you're singing this carol, to look at the heart of the man that wrote the carol. So I'm sure many of you do know that it's Charles Wesley that wrote the carol, and there's a picture of him coming up on the screen here any minute. Um, so this is Charles Wesley. I kind of have in my head, and I don't know whether I should say it, and then I think, well, it's in my head anyway, so I might as well say it. He's quite a handsome man. I don't know if I'm allowed to say that, but I, uh, when I was looking at him, I thought, you know, he has a lovely, open, warm gentle face about him, but the story of Charles Wesley and how he got to write this carol was Charles Wesley grew up and his father, his grandfather, and his great-grandfather were all ministers in the Church of England. So there was plenty of pressure there. And in fact, his father even was very forthright to say, I want all my sons to go into the ministry. And they all did. Now, Charles was, was quite reluctant about it, but he went off in 1726 to Oxford to study divinity. And he describes in, his, uh, in one of his diaries, he says that uh, for the first year at Oxford, uh, it was a diversion. And then somebody else filled it in when they were describing what that would mean in those days. That meant that he was pubbing what we would probably call clubbing. He was pubbing, gin was rife. Um, in those days, he was pubbing, he was playing cards, he was going to the theater, um, he was going down the wrong road. In fact, his mother sent his, one of his brothers to him. Um, but Charles came back off his own. Charles, Charles came back, came back of, his, of his own volition, back to the way that he was brought up. But what he did when he came back um, was he went to the other extreme. So in Oxford, they then started a holy club. And uh, there was a, a number of guys in this club and, and they were known for their mastery of, like they got up really early. They fasted and prayed. They had regular scripture study. They, they had self-examination. They did prison ministry. And you might think in the 1700s, well, sure, everybody did that. They were all very good. In this period of time, when you read the history books, it's almost like it's describing a bit like our own generation. It was a lost, dark time um, in those days when Charles Wesley was doing this. And this is, they then got the nickname of the Methodists. That's where the name Methodist comes from because him and his brother started the Methodist church. And he was eventually ordained. He was very reluctant. His brother said, we're going off to Georgia, to the colonies in America to be missionaries and you need to be ordained. So he was ordained a deacon and a priest in two weeks. He wanted to be a scholar and off they went to Georgia. And it was on the boat uh, that they were traveling across the Atlantic Ocean to go and be missionaries, missionaries of the, of the Church of England, when they came across a group of Moravian Christians, German Christians, who also were going to be missionaries in America. And this is, he describes that this is the very first time he comes across congregational singing. In the Church of England, they had always had choirs that sung. So he had gone to church and he'd never had like what we have. You know, can you imagine hearing that for the first time? We can vaguely, I remember being how ticked off I was that I couldn't sing during COVID because I grew up singing and worshiping. But this was the first time he heard people 
sing worship songs together. Um, and then one night, there was a raging storm and really they thought the ship was going to go down. They thought they were all going to die. It was a tremendously terrifying experience. But there was a marked difference between the way um, Charles and his brother reacted to the way the Moravians reacted. The Moravians were singing. They weren't afraid. And when the storm did die down, Charles went and asked them. He said, why were you not afraid? Why were you not afraid to die? And, and, and they said, but if we die, we go to be with Jesus. So we don't have any fear of death. And this struck a chord in him because he knew that he didn't have that. He knew that he didn't have what, what they had. He had no assurance, even with all his religion, he had no assurance, he had no peace. But it wasn't until he returned, the, obviously the, the missionary escapade didn't, it didn't go very well, and he came back to England, and he was very, very ill, and dying on, on his, almost on his, what could have been his deathbed, this gentleman who was staying with him, who again happened to be a Moravian, asked him, and he asked, asked him gently, he describes it in his diary, he says, Charles, do you expect to be saved? And Charles lying there said to him, yes, I do. And the gentleman said to him, why? Why do you expect to be saved? And Charles really wasn't even on his deathbed. This question rattled him and he, he says he replies, I have used my best endeavors to serve God. Would he rob me of my endeavors? I have nothing left to trust. You see, his heart was deceiving him. His heart had told him he had to be good. His heart had told him that he was good. And he was very good at being good. He was meticulous about his religion. And it was while he was recovering from this illness that these offensive questions about his salvation were going round in his head. And he describes in his diary how he was crying out in agony. Now he was only 31. He was crying out in agony. And then it was on Pentecost Sunday, which was just a few days before his brother uh, had his heart strangely warmed at Aldergate. Um, he said that he had a revelation from the Holy Spirit that brought healing and wholeness to him. And he describes in his diary, he says, I felt a strange palpitation of heart. I said, Yet I feared to say, I believe. And he describes going to bed, being very sensible of his own weakness, but confident of Christ's protection. Confident of his conversion to Jesus Christ. That it was by faith alone that he was saved. And this transformed, he described how this transformed his whole life. And you know, we sing that song on a, on a Sunday night, shake up the ground of all my tradition, break down the walls of all my religion, your way is better. Do you know that one? You can hear it in your head, yeah. And this is where the walls of his heart had been broken down. He had sought the life of the Holy Spirit and it was almost as if the Holy Spirit had exploded in his heart. He was converted in his heart. And he'd been transformed from what people would have described as this traditionalist, this very strict um, high church man. And he was transformed into an emotional evangelist. What about that? More emotional evangelist, more emotional evangelism. And his preaching was described that it was very pointed and it was very emotive and it was very graphic. And it was, there was so much passion in him from the Holy Spirit in his heart that he was actually refused pulpits. He wasn't allowed to speak. They couldn't cope with his enthusiasm. So he didn't stop him and his brother and another friend, George Whitfield. They went, they just went out and they, they preached in, in markets and in fields. And they actually came over to Ireland. He describes being in Ireland twice and his preaching was obviously so offensive that he says that on one occasion he was chased by a mob and he had to hide in a milk house and the farmer's wife had to rescue him. 
and this was in County Down. I would love to know where this was, but this boy that wrote this carol was chased somewhere in County Down and had to hide behind a milk house. And this passion went on. He wrote 9,000 hymns in 50 years, of which Hark the Herald is one. And he wrote that on the first Christmas after his conversion. And he describes it like, like I was just there. And when I read that, I thought it was, oh, yes, that's, I would just love to have been there when the, the angels, when the angels were, were, were singing. Um, and one of his biographers described him that he couldn't, he couldn't get it out. He just couldn't get it um, complete as to what he was doing. His heart had been infused by the Holy Spirit. And I just want to ask you as I finish, that was Charles Wesley's heart. That was the heart that wrote Heart the Herald. What about your heart? And I want you to imagine you're having a dream and you've turned up for church. You've turned up this evening and you've come through the door and there's nobody here. It's just you. But you notice that there's somebody standing up here beside the Christmas tree. And instinctively in your heart, you know that that's Jesus. And you've just walked into this space. There's nobody else here. Just you and him. What would you do? What would your heart tell you to do? Would you run outside and lean against the wall and catch your breath? Would you stay down at the back? Would you come up the side aisle? Would you come running to him? How close would you be prepared to come. How close would your heart let you come? I want you to, to leave you with, with that question. Maybe you'll go for coffee tomorrow and just sit in a coffee shop and think, what if I walked into church and there was nobody else there, just Jesus? What would I do? Where would my heart take me? And don't be embarrassed if you would want to run. If you would want to run to him. He would say, I'm glad you've come. I have more. If you're halfway down, he might say, come. It's okay. Come close. I want to give you my spirit. And maybe if you turned and walked out, he would say, don't go. Don't go out into the darkness. Come and and have the warmth of my light. Because this is what we sing about. This is what we will sing about now as the band to come up and, and join us. This is the heart before the Lord, the heart that wants to be filled with him. And this is a carol that sings of the love and the glory that is is his that wants to come, wants to come, come in to your individual heart and to make his home with you. So let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you that you came. We We talk about things like, thank you for your plan of salvation, but Lord, thank you for the intimacy that that brings. Thank you for the intimacy that that means, that you come and humbly make your home in our hearts. So Lord, as we worship, as we we go into the week ahead with all the Christmas stuff around us, may we ask that question of ourselves, if it was just, just us and you, by ourselves, where would our heart take us? How close would we come? I pray, Father, by your spirit, you would draw us, draw us in, come, come into our hearts, come with your light and your warmth. In Jesus' name, amen.